The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. It was Oscar Wilde who wrote, in a surprisingly gentle and almost naive tone, Death must be so beautiful to lie and listen to silence, to have no yesterday and no tomorrow, to forget time, to forgive life, to stay at peace. The trouble is, not all the dead will stay quietly asleep. That's why we have ghost stories. Our mystery drama, The Ghostly Private Eye, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Larry Haynes. Whenever the argument about the oldest of professions arises, along with the prostitute, the actor, the moneylender, and others, certainly we must include that of the private eye. Sometimes honorable beyond belief, as in the case of Cain and Abel when Jehovah himself solved the murder. Many more times, not the most prized member of society, still a figure to be reckoned with. Of all the modern ones, no one is more special than the parapsychologist, the man who deals in the explanation of that vast middle world of clairvoyance, extrasensory perception, and psychic phenomena. The explainer of the inexplicable, such a man as the singular Mr. Flaxman Lowe. Hello? Uh, Mr. Flaxman Lowe? Yes, the same. This is George Blackburton. Uh, you, you know, we've seen each other casually at the club. Oh, yes, of course, Sir George. Well, I, uh, I feel like the devil bothering you like this, but you were pointed out to me as someone who, well, was more or less an expert in the occult and supernatural. Well, I have made a good deal of investigation, yes, but... Uh... I'm in desperate need of help. Could you come right down to my place in Surrey? We, we have something that even my wife can't cope with. Uh, something? Uh, perhaps it's an old curse. I, I don't know. But there is a thing that is trying to crowd us out of the house that you can actually taste and smell. Disgusting and terrifying. I need help. Well, I, uh, I don't know about immediately. I'm expecting a guest from France whom I must pick up shortly. Oh, by all means, bring him with you. Let him be our guest, too, for the weekend. If you don't help us... I'm afraid I'll go stark, staring mad. Oh, very well. I think it might be arranged. Monsieur Lowe, I recognize you from your photograph. Oh, my dear boy, you must be Professor Jean Thierry. I am. Well, you look young enough to be my son, and with such a formidable academic background. As I come to meet you, I am a child at the feet of the master. Oh, 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 oh <laughs> now you make me feel like the all-wise spirit. Well, are you not the king of ghost killers, the master of the spirit world? Oh, scarcely. I'm a child in the wilderness of the afterworld. And at the moment, an embarrassed host. Oh, why? Well, uh, what would you say if instead of taking you home to my comfortable fire, as I'd planned to, I whisked you off instead into the depths of Kent? For a weekend at a haunted house, far beyond your belief, and which even stretches mine. What would I say? <laughs> what am I here for? Well, so we stay right here in the station and catch the next train for Yand Manor House. We had corresponded for years, the Dr. Flexman and I, and the quality of his mind was such that I had been most eager to meet him to argue vis-a-vis -vis our contrasting belief on the matter of life after death. So what matter that our first conversation was on a train headed for this house with a strange name, Yand Manor House. 
Why, this house that you have been asked to investigate, it has a ghost. Oh, most definitely, yes. Is it uh, an especially convincing ghost? Well, I think you'll find that it is. Uh, then you are promising me an exceptional adventure. One not without a great deal of danger. Well, I can't judge that, though, without trying, can I? Well, that's the nature of contact with the world beyond. Ah, but first you must prove it to me. I simply do not believe in ghosts. Or spirit manifestation, occult phenomena, whatever is the rubbish bin into which most people throw any belief they cannot understand. Mm. Well, this rubbish heap is what I spend my life investigating. Mm. Chacun a son goût. No. To each his own. Mm. And yet, are we all so sure and secure about what we think we know? <laughs> I realize that you're aware of I, I've had some considerable success searching through the trash that most people discount. Well, what can I answer? That I rebel against the whole idea? After all, I have no experience in these matters, except vicariously through studying and reading. Very well. And now you're about to have some first-hand direct experience, which I hope you will not come to regret. We went straight to Yand Manor House. Certainly on my part, totally unaware of the terror that was to face us and of a gaping world of swirling doubt, bottomless, and as insecure as that dreadful dream of falling from incalculable heights to impossible depths. A dream beyond belief that was to haunt me the rest of my days. We were met at the train by Sir George and quickly transferred to a large and luxurious landau with a magnificent pair of horses. I had been prepared for something quite magnificent when we approached Yand Manor House, but actually it was not so impressive compared to the property that surrounded it. A square brick house, notable only for a strangely out-of-character building at the end of the garden that was unmistakably... A mausoleum. But our hosts, I found quite charming. Your rooms are comfortable, I hope, Mr. Lowe, Professor Thierry. Oh, I find mine even better than that. Cozy. Oh, yes, mine too. I feel quite at home. And you need have no worries. I have swept them myself. Uh, what Cynthia means is that she has, uh, well, not literally swept them for dust, but uh, for any sign or evidence of... Uh, supernatural occupation or presence. I assure you, they're quite clean. In fact, I've combed the whole house and there's not a jot of evidence that any spirit forces or spectral emanations exist. Save for, of course, the den. I'm a psychic, too, you know, Mr. Lowe. Oh, well, you flatter me, Lady Blackbird, and I don't consider myself one, only an investigator of psychic phenomena. You do not believe in the spirit world? Ah, that's a different matter. I think you will find, madame, that he is a true believer. I am the, uh, how do you say, the uh, fly in the ointment. Well, monsieur, before you leave Yand House, I can promise we will have made a true believer of you. Well, you sound almost as though you enjoyed this ghost which uh, so concerns your husband. Oh, no. No, this is something malignant, destructive. It must be exorcised. I tried to reach it through spiritualism, but without success. I only hope that with your help, perhaps we can. Mm. Uh, may I ask when we're to see the room? Uh, we're waiting only for my nephew who will be joining us for dinner. We will be five, the Pentateuch, the perfect number for a seance. One reason why we were delighted when you asked if you could bring a guest, Dr. Lowe. I only hope, madame, that I will not be a limiting factor. We ask only for your cooperation. I feel quite sure we'll end up by winning your belief. Ah, that'll be Charles now. Uh, don't you think, my dear, it might be a good idea for us all to go straight into dinner? I think perhaps it would. Gentlemen, will you join me? There had been a curious little family byplay between Sir George and his wife, which was soon explained to me after I met Charles Volney. He was a large, uh, heavy young man with an athletic build. I can't say I found him an attractive personality, but what was most noticeable about him was that he was already on his way to another evening, which could only lead to a hangover in the morning. 
Hey, and so, Aunt Cynthia, we're to have another table-tapping session? Charles, I won't have you talk to your aunt that way. Well, good Lord, Uncle George, has she really got you believing in all this twaddle? The strange things that happen in that room can't be taken lightly. He doesn't really take them lightly at all, George. The bravado is just to cover up his own fear. Rubbish, Auntie. Some wind blowing down the chimney, rustling the ivy and swinging something loose against a window, uh, or the creaks and groans of this drafty old house. <laughs> Nonsense. Are, are you seriously interested in all this balderdash, Dr. Lowe? Well, yes, yes. After all, I have made it my life work. Yes, of course, but to expose frauds and to show up fakers. Uh, in part, yes, that is a byproduct. Now, you're not going to tell me you actually believe in bits of ectoplasm bumbling about groaning and clanking chains. Mm. May I quote you from Hamlet? There are more things under heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed oh, of. Oh, Lord, I'm in a nest of nuts. No, not quite. You have uh, another skeptic at the table. Ah, Professor Thierry, huh? Yes, you see, we're a good balance. Two for, two against, and Sir George somewhere in the middle. Well, I'm not so sure anymore, Flaxman. Not after the last experience. The one that sent me scurrying to you for help. Now, my information about the room, we're about to, uh... uh what's the best word? Shall we, uh, settle for, uh, invade? It was, uh, still sketchy. <laughs> Naturally, Dr. Lowe. It has to be all the things you can't question. Only interpret. The wind blowing, a shutter clacking. You know, it's so easy if you can't see anything face to face. Yes, sir, look, if you'll excuse me, uh, Charles, I think there have been other manifestations. Am I wrong? Far from it. Hearing and seeing are not the only senses. One can actually feel the presence. Oh, it's all in the mind. It's a lot more than that, damn it. I tell you, one can smell it. Smell it? The fetid odor of death, the grave and decay. It's not only smell, but taste. If it runs two to form, after a certain hour, none of us will be able to remain in the room. Why? Because, my dear nephew, we shall be crowded out. But why would this, uh, this presence, or whatever it is, want to, uh, uh, your strange phrase, uh, crowd anyone out? It's an experience one can't describe that one has to live, Professor Thierry. As if, somewhere in one's daily life, one closed one's eyes for a second and suddenly realized he was standing at the verge of a gaping hole that plunged into such terrifying darkness and eternal damnation that a bile of terror rises in the throat and threatens to suffocate you. There's an enemy in that room at such times who presses against you so massively that you feel as if you're being trampled under a multitude, helpless against a torrent. A stifling, a, a force that you must move from or be smothered to death. It... Oh, forgive me. This is not exactly after-dinner conversation. But it is a reality in George's and my life that we must face or run from if we can. We've decided to face it. Will you chance it with us? We have gotten ourselves involved in something this time around, haven't we? I don't know where each of you stands on the power of the spirit world, extension after death, or belief in ghosts... But I do hope you'll stay to do a little more research with me and Mr. Lowe on the nature of it, the possibility of it, and exactly what effects it can have on us. I shall return shortly with Act Two. sit in the shadow of the great carved chimney piece which rises above the mantel to the high ceiling. About a dark table of fumed oak, they hold hands. Four of them watch Cynthia go into trance and wait for the manifestations from beyond. The room is dark and brooding enough to raise Satan himself. The lamps smoke and cloud the atmosphere 
as if the air pressure is heavy beyond nature. But nothing happens. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we are trying to reach you. Can you not answer? Answer. No. Not tonight. Tonight I can't do it, George. There are forces against me. I don't know what it is. Break the circle. Bring up the lights. I will, Cynthia, my dear. And uh, rest. Relax. Uh, oh. Cynthia, you extend yourself too much. I'm all right, George, dear. But I must, uh, I must rest now. If you excuse me, I... Well, we may not have raised any wandering spirits inside, but we seem to have created some outside. If you'll excuse me, I think I'd best see Cynthia up to bed. Please give my apologies to our guest. Hush, Cynthia. Don't worry about I it. worry about what I must. Did you ride over, Charles? Oh, yes, Uncle. I don't want you to go back in the storm like this. You must stay. Any one of the rooms in the West Wing, they're all made up. Now, don't you worry about me. But I do. Very well, Auntie. I promise. Uh, come along, Cynthia. Uh, uh, Charles, since I'll not be down again tonight, will you see to our guest needs? I also promise to be an excellent host, Uncle George. Good night. Good night, Lady Blackburn, Sir George. Good night. Well, gentlemen, what should it be? Whiskey, gin, brandy? Uh, no, no, no. For me, nothing. Oh, it was a long journey from Paris, and this afternoon's trip has finished the job. I am exhausted. Oh, I don't think I want any either. Why, why don't we all just go up to bed? Huh? Ah, yes, bed, sleep. Those I welcome. But, um, I'm not going upstairs. Well, you're not going to ride home in weather like this. No, 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 Mr. Lowe. I'm going to spend the night, uh, right here. You mean in this room? <laughs> That's right. Either I will sleep the sleep of the unrighteous, or if I'm wrong and my aunt's right, I'll have some company. Now, I mean to put an end to all this nonsense about ghosts and ghouls. Then I shall uh, sit up with you. Oh, perish the thought, Mr. Lowe. With your reputation, I'm sure any self-respecting member of the other world would give you a wide berth. <laughs> Well, are you still sure you won't join me in a brandy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well. Mr. Paul May, may I ask you to be serious for a moment? You may ask me. I don't think you should take your aunt's warning lightly. Even though there's been no physical evidence tonight, apparently some malignant and dangerous force considers this room its province. Then if it does, I intend to disabuse it of the idea. More than that, I'd want it off my turf. You see, this house will be mine one day, very soon, if my aunt and uncle decide to return to traveling. And I want uh, it, whoever or whatever it might be, and Aunt mark you, I don't believe it exists. I want it to know that when I take over, there'll only be room for one of us. And no amount of discussion would persuade this headstrong young man to change his mind. Personally, I couldn't help agreeing with his point of view. The idea of anything supernatural daring to intrude in this temple of the normal and the everyday seemed ludicrous. So, Flaxman and I went upstairs. John, yes. I am concerned. <laughs> About me? Actually, I must admit my concern was more for that young man downstairs. <laughs> I should not worry about him. One more drink and the wine will put him straight to sleep. Well, I'm not worried about anything that may threaten him uh, in this world. I left my practical French friend and went to my own room. The storm was still whistling and moaning about Yant Manor House, but it was a perfectly natural phenomenon, and it was certainly no cause for alarm. I must have been sleeping lightly for a grandfather clock striking the three-quarter hour somewhere in the house woke me up. I glanced at my watch and saw that it was a quarter to midnight. I shrugged into my robe and slippers and stole downstairs. The house was silent save for the moan of the wind and the steady drum of the rain outside. The door to the den was closed, and I opened it, filled with a nameless apprehension. 
I could have saved myself my uneasiness. Stretched out comfortably on the couch, a still unemptied glass in his hand lay Charles Volney, snoring contentedly and looking to my middle-aged envy, the picture of health in spite of all his drinking. I removed the glass and set it aside. For a moment I considered getting him out of there. But he was so soundly in his cups and such a heavy young man, the effort was beyond me. Besides, I was getting cold. So I stoked up the fire and left him. To my eternal regret, as it turned out. Dr. Lowe. Uh, Dr. Lowe. Yes, yes, yes. Just a moment. Be right there. Oh, come in. The door is open. I'm... Sorry to disturb you so early in the morning. No, no, no. It's quite all right. What time is it? The sun isn't even up, I'm afraid. Oh, 5.30. Uh, but something dreadful's occurred. Oh, forgive my almost whispering, but I don't want Cynthia to know yet. All right. What is it? It's... It's Charles... I... Uh, hello. Forgive me. I thought I heard an urgent knocking. Do I intrude? Uh, quite all right, Professor. Everyone must know sooner or later. My nephew Charles is... Is dead. What? Oh, quel mauvais fortune. How, how? That's the terrifying thing. I want you to come and see for yourself and answer me that question. I followed Dr. Lowe and Sir George downstairs to that terrible room. Except that the fire had burned out. It looked much as it did when we all had left the night before. Except for Charles Volney. If I can refer to the caricature of him that we saw. He was braced in the corner between the window recess and where the chimney jutted out as if he had tried to escape and been glued there by some giant force that literally crushed him. His face was suffused with blood, his eyes starting from his head. He was quite dead. He must have been dead for several hours. What do you think, Dr. Lowe? Frightened to death? No, 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 more than that. He was uh, smothered, asphyxiated. I don't quite know how to describe it. Uh, pressed, pressed to death almost. Yes, once during the war, I had a friend in, in a building that was bombed. He was not injured directly. Only the force of the blast within a confined space drove him against the wall and somehow flattened him. Uh, he was spread wide. Good Lord. It's not natural. No. No, my friend Sir George, it is, uh, I'm afraid, supernatural. Yes, he should have listened to your wife, and I should have listened to my own misgivings. Uh, alas, I feel at fault no, there. No, 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 Jean. I came down last night again, just before midnight. He'd passed out on the couch, and I couldn't move him. It's no one's fault but mine. I should never have come back to this accursed house. And I'll call Mr. Bunbury. He's our local superintendent of police. Show sure. I. I'll save you for the loss, Mr. Lowe, knowing your reputation and all. Well, I don't know whether that's a plus or a minus. Oh, now, sir, plus, of course. And not that I understand some of your investigations, but you stand very high at Scotland Yard, very high. Thank you. Now, I've checked out the servants, and they can all alibi each other for one reason or another. On the other hand, I can't seriously imagine a suspect among all of you in the main house here, even admitting that Sir George, and particularly his lady, are a bit of a rum go, both of them, oh, but particularly her. Are you, uh, are you referring to her belief in spiritualism, Superintendent? Eh, hey, that'd be it, sir. And then, uh, a couple of things Sir George told me. Oh, may I ask what? Oh, my intention is to tell you. That's why I brought it up. First off, he said he came down here by candlelight and found the deceased. Mm -hmm. But the, before he did, passing the mantel place, the candle went out. Just as something like, well, in his own words, something spectral brushed across my cheek and I saw in front of my face two barred eyes looking at me. Uh, barred eyes? Now, what does that mean? Oh, that's exactly what I asked, sir. And, and he replied, eyes that looked at me as though through the bars of a cage. And then 
I was conscious of a strange flat taste in my mouth and the odor of damp and decay. And I lit the candle and saw poor Charles. Now, what do you make of that, sir? Well... You've seen the corpse. What do you make of it, Superintendent? Why, oh, don't you? That's why I'm asking you. Uh-huh. Uh, you don't believe in ghosts, I take it. Well, I haven't. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, I know you've been in on many investigations, however, where it seemed to be something like that, only, you know, wasn't. Well, can you think of any other explanation for this death? Meaning that you think it was something, uh... Supernatural? Well, I don't see any other explanation for the moment. Oh, I wouldn't think that would quite satisfy my superiors. I mean, it's quite clear the chap couldn't have killed himself, you see. So someone else has to be guilty. And I hope for everyone's sake we can find out just who. It was sheer inadvertence that I happened to be in the solarium right off the porch where this interview took place. Or was it? Because as soon as it was over and the sergeant had left, um, Flaxman came out to join me. John, you heard that? Yes. I'm beginning to wonder if I was meant to. I uh, wasn't quite deliberate on my part, but since I knew you were here, I thought you might just as well because of tonight. Tonight? What is tonight? I, uh, I don't know how much it'll help with the police, but it might lead to ultimate proof for me to win an argument with you that has stretched out over many years of correspondence. I am still in the dark. Well, as I or we may very well find ourselves tonight. Uh Aha, where? In the room where Charles died. I intend to spend a night there as he did. Um, Do you want to share my vigil against the total powers of darkness? As Professor Thierry regards his brilliant but strange friend and intellectual enemy, remembering the horrible death he has seen one man suffer, but pondering the challenge of ultimate proof on a basic principle, I must leave them, and you, till I return with Act Three. difficult day at Yand Manor House. The comings and goings, police, photographers, inevitably the newspapers. Finally, the undertaker and the removal of what is left of Charles Volney's terrestrial presence. Sir George and his wife have naturally been totally involved in this, and it is not until evening that their guests, who have tactfully tried to stay out from underfoot, have been able to exchange more than a few words with either of them. Now, Mrs. Blackburton has at last been able to find a moment alone with Flaxman Lowe, walking in the garden. It's all my fault, you see. No, no, I don't see. I was the one who talked George into coming back to Yan Manor after all these years. Oh, Lady Blackburton, there's a bench right here. Would you like to sit down? Oh, beside the mausoleum? Why not? It's strangely appropriate. Why? What is this building? Well, that's part of it all. Yen Manor has been in George's family since a sort of granduncle willed it to his grandfather with a specific reservation. And that was? That in perpetuity, till the last of the Blackburton heirs, Yand House must remain in the family's hands. And that if the family didn't occupy it, it couldn't be rented. Well, now, I doubt if that would hold up in any legal court. Possibly not, but beyond that, there was the curse. The curse? That anyone who broke the promise or the letter of it would die a horrible death. Oh, I see. And, uh, Sir George, believe this. George is such a decent man, Dr. Lowe. It wouldn't have had to go that far. He would have just lived up to a family promise as his father and he had in their own way and kept Gand House without living in it. Hmm. But you see, I was the one who forced the issue. Oh, you decided that as long as you were back in England, it was silly not to live in a house you already owned. Yes. Plus, by now, my... 
My dedication to spiritualism, my new venture into the occult. Mm -hmm. So I'm the author and the instrument of this tragedy. I feel as if I'd actually murdered my nephew, Charles. Oh, well, Lady Blackbird and I don't understand that. Because having forced George to return here against his will, he'd rebelled. He didn't like all these supernatural manifestations. And it was only at my insistence, at my plea, that he brought you down here. Oh. If they couldn't be stopped, or explained, he determined to sell the property and destroy this mausoleum. I see. As soon as it was legally possible. And, uh, may I ask who rests here? That uncle of George's grandfather who started this whole thing. His body is actually in that tomb? Yes. Locked in a strange lead casket. A lead casket? This uncle was a strange man with an inordinate fear of death. Oh. It said that he predicted his own death and arranged to have a doctor in attendance. I mean, he died very suddenly and unexpectedly. I see. Uh, Lady Blackburton, you're asking for my help, aren't you? I have no right to, but... Yes. I feel that my hobbies have inadvertently led my husband and his family into a terrible peril. The only one I know who might save them is you. I see. Then may I have your husband's and your permission to spend tonight in the den as your nephew did last night? Why do you want to risk your life? Well, I won't deny it may be risk, but... Uh, first of all, I know what I'm doing, which your nephew did not. And second, I shall not be alone. so it was we came to that fateful night. My friend Flaxman Lowe and I entered that fearful room, closed the door behind us, and settled down to challenge whatever malevolent spirit he thought still occupied it. I was still skeptical and remaining to be convinced. This is the account of that evening. It was very different from the night before. No wind was stirring. It had been a beautiful sunset. There was no need for a fire. And for some time, after long discussion, Jean, Thierry, and I were sitting quietly. All of a sudden, he rose. Uh, I'm thirsty. Would you like a drink? Uh, no, no. Thank you, Jean. I want to have all my senses alert. I meant only plain water. No, thank you. Oh, what an abominable taste. What, the water? No, I haven't touched it yet. It, it is as if some horrible fly has flown into my mouth. It is mm. disgusting. Yes, yes, like, like a fungus growth. Yes, repulsive like that. Yeah, I ask only because I feel the same. Well, I think you're about to be convinced. Uh, you don't mean that. Why did you put out the lamp? I didn't. Uh, light the candle beside you on the table. Very well. Uh, Tonnerre, uh, give me your matches, Dr. Lowe. Mine now, damn it. Uh, where are you? I'm here. Oh, it is as dark as Egypt. I am coming. I'm coming. Oh, it is so hard to get along. Hard to get along? Yes, I, I am unable to move. I am suffocating. Where are you? I, I am here by the door. I... The air in the room had become palpable to the touch. Heavy. With the sensation of smothering cold human flesh. I fought against it, gasping for breath. The clammy flesh crowding over me, smothering me like some fat, nauseating humanoid jellyfish. And then, across my cheek, there was a stinging, reeking pain. With my last strength, I fled the terror. There was a crash of glass, a wild rush of air, and I knew no more. When I came to, I saw the dawn was breaking to the east, and I was lying on the lawn of Yand Manor House. Above me was a shattered lattice window swinging in the wind, and clutched in my hand was something dark in color, slender and twisted. It might have been the skin of an adder, a piece of bark rolling itself up like a parchment scroll or the desiccated claw of some unimaginable beast from hell. 
I hurried into the house, barely conscious of the smarting pain in my left cheek. Fearful only for my friend Jean, I found him unconscious just outside the door to that baleful room. But thank God, alive. Oh, looks like... Yes, just take it easy, Jean. Been... All right, now, can you stand? Are you all right? Yes, huh? I think so. All right. You have a bruise on your forehead. Are you dizzy? No, no, not, not anymore. What happened to you? I, I don't know. I, I was literally crowded out of the room by that infernal thing. What was it? With its damp, swelling flesh, I was buried in that stifling pulp it pushed and swelled against me, driving me away from you in the dark to the door. I, I called out, but I could hear no answer. What was that ghastly presence? Well, I think I can answer that now. It was what killed the young man, no? Yes, the very same. And I hope I can convince the inspector of that. Well, you have made a convert of me. Why not him? Well, we shall see. <laughs> First of all, Sir George, the uh, spectral hand that seemed to brush across your face as you told Superintendent Bumbry. Yes? Uh, you, were, you were by the uh, fireplace at the time, passing the ornamental foremantle that rises above it. Yes. Uh, you see all those figures carved there, in particular the griffin, and uh, hanging from the sharp point of its beak, these... Human hairs. Yes, human hairs, black. Now, whose would you say they were? Both Professor Thierry and myself are gray. You're light-haired and your nephew was fair. Sir George is sandy. Now, who else frequents this room? No one. Except the maid, who is also graying. But these are a woman's hair. Why? Why? Because they're long? Well, yes. Uh-huh. And this? Uh, what is that? Uh, could I see? Sure. Hmm. A long, thin object, half brown, half yellow, and... Twisted like the blade of a corkscrew. Well, I have no idea. Well, suppose I suggest it's a human nail, which time and neglect is allowed to grow to superhuman proportions. Mon Dieu, it would have to be 12 inches long. <laughs> Nobody but an ancient Chinese Mandarin could grow such a monstrosity. Or a corpse who refused to die. I don't quite get that last. Uh, Mr. Superintendent... Let me project something. This uh, uncle who left Yan Manor House to your grandfather, Sir George. Was he dark and her suit? Was he a recluse? Did he build a mausoleum in the garden? And did he have an inordinate fear of death? Yes, to all counts. And is it not true that both you and the nephew who might have been your heir were ready to take all steps to get rid of this mausoleum and or Yan Manor House, particularly your nephew? I suppose so. Then, Superintendent, I can categorically tell you that your murderer lies in the casket in that mausoleum and the murderer of anyone who tries to oust him from this property as long as he shall live. Are you suggesting that a man dead over a century is still in some sense alive? Unless it sustains injury itself. The brain is the last to die. In fact, it's the only measure of finite death. Now open the coffin... And you'll see what I mean. It was complicated, of course, with all the necessary red tape. But on a certain day, the coffin, which took ten men to move out into the sunlight and sealed as tight as a drum, was opened. Perhaps, perhaps, Lady Blackburton. But you see, the urge, the dream, the thirst for immortality persists. His own special coffin sealed airtight. So confining that when his soul stirred beyond his finite body, he must have had an illimitable desire to expand and choke out anyone who stood in his way. But after a hundred years, the flesh, the form, still... Skin undisturbed. Except for the hair and the nails and the eyelashes. Look at the length of them. All of them must have kept growing since he was locked in the coffin. Are you suggesting this man was... or is still alive? In a sense, yes, Superintendent. You see, he seems to have mastered some ancient formula... 
whereby the body is saved from complete disintegration. And you can see that evidence before you. So that closes your case for you, Mr. Superintendent. Now you know how young Mr. Volney met his death. And what about us, Dr. Lowe? Oh, I think you'll have little reason for fear being haunted anymore. You see, in the sunlight, the body already is beginning to disintegrate. By the end of the day, there'll be nothing left but a fleshless skeleton. How can I thank you for what you've accomplished? I don't thank me. It's fate and the proper relationship of things. God and the world have a way of reestablishing those. And have I convinced you, Professor, that at least there is something beyond your pragmatic values? My dear Dr. Lowe, you have convinced me that you will add another branch to our sciences. But I must admit, you establish your facts too well for my total peace of mind. The remarkable Flaxman Lowe, parapsychic private eye, has been and continues to be a dominating figure in the field of parapsychology and in unraveling its mysteries, or at least illuminating them. If this is a field which interests you, perhaps I shall bring you other cases in the future. of that ominous and ancient ancestor have long been transferred to a normal burying place and the mausoleum torn down. Sir George and his wife stay on at Yand Manor House. Cynthia Blackburton has long since given up spiritualism and assorted interests in favor of feminism. Of course, since she is still in the 19th century, you might not recognize it for what it is today. But her spirit lingers on through the women's suffragette movement. Through memories of Emma Goldman and her sister standard bearers, who were the progenitors of women's lib. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Paul Hecht, Betty Winkler, Guy Sorrell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Time now, 11 p.m. CBS News. Jimmy Carter sharpens his campaign against President Ford. Monday, making references to reports the president went on golfing weekends as a congressman uh, with a U.S. Steel lobbyist. I'm David Jackson reporting on the CBS radio network. Correspondent Sharon Lovejoy is following the Carter campaign and has this report. On the campaign trail in Oregon, Jimmy Carter stepped up his attacks on the Republican administration and his opponent, President Ford, needling the president in a speech before a group of labor leaders. When asked if he was sorry about his interview with Playboy magazine and the reaction to his statements that he had lusted after women many times in his heart, Carter said he'd rather run an open campaign and run the risk of making a mistake every now and then than isolate himself from the American people and hide in the White House Rose Garden for eight weeks, as the president has done. Later, at a rally in Portland, 
Portland, Carter told a crowd of 5,000 that the political leadership in this country has been bogged down in Washington for the last 25 to 30 years, deriving its advice and counsel from lobbyists and special interest groups. Carter promised, as he always does, to turn the government back to the people if elected, and the large, friendly crowd responded with applause and cheers. Carter is encouraged by post-debate polls, which show him doing well in Oregon, and his staff feels deserances can only add to his growing support here. Sean Lovejoy, CBS News, with the Carter campaign. President Ford returned to the White House Monday evening, aides saying he was pleased with his three-day campaign trip through the South. In Miami earlier Monday, Mr. Ford outlined a crime control plan to a convention of police chiefs. Mr. Ford called for tougher penalties for professional criminals, saying it's time to give the streets back to law-abiding citizens. Rebelling inmates at a prison near Vancouver, British Columbia are holding hostages there. Rick Hunt has a report. Six to ten convicts at the British Columbia Penitentiary in New Westminster are holding two guards hostage at knife point in the prison's kitchen. The deputy regional director of security at the prison, Herb Bennett, says that no list of demands has been presented to authorities. He also says he's been able to communicate with the hostages and has received their assurances they have not been harmed. The hostage incident took place at the same time as about 200 inmates in the east wing of the prison went on a rampage and they are refusing to enter their cells. Instead, they are milling about wrecking railings and other objects. The block has been sealed off and guards are keeping a close watch on both it and the hostage situation. New Westminster police have been called in as well as all off-duty prison personnel and ambulances are standing by at the prison. Rick Hunt for CBS News, Vancouver. A House Senate conference committee worked late into the night and came to agreement on a bill providing more than $25 billion in federal revenue sharing money for states, cities, and counties through 1980. The legislation is expected to get final approval in the House and Senate later this week. Union and company negotiators in Detroit are said to be making some progress towards settling the two-week-old United Auto Workers strike against Ford Motor Company, but a union source cautions agreement on a new contract may not come until next week at the earliest. Now this. The wonderful world of baseball. Do you remember Mickey Owen and the pass ball episode in the 1941 series? Well, we're going to relive that great moment and dozens more the weekend of October 2nd and 3rd on the wonderful world of baseball. I'm Wynn Elliott, CBS Radio Sports, and through the weekend I'm going to bring you 17 memory and action-packed broadcasts of the greatest moments from past World Series. The wonderful world of baseball, October 2nd and 3rd, the CBS Radio Network. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, the Anti-Obscenity Board keeps a file of pornographic material, a file that's open to the public. Anyone can come in to look through it. City Clerk Mary Lou Cooper says some of the people who come in have good reasons, such as lawyers working on pornography cases. Others just browse. The worst offenders, she says, are city workers and reporters. Then there's that last magazine that was banned by the board. Clerk Cooper says a lot of citizens have been in to see that one, so they'll know just what is considered obscene. David Jackson, CBS News.